t- let's start off here our conversation just giving us a little uh, who you are. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, I'm uh, I'm Jim Odell. I've uh, been in the brush area since the early 70s. Uh, before that, I came from the Greeley, Kuhn, or Kersey area and uh, been an auctioneer for a long time, uh, managed several different livestock markets, and enjoyed the livestock business tremendously. And what made you decide to locate to brush? Well, it's a long story. <clears throat> Back then, I was uh, selling a lot of auctions each week. In fact, I was selling five auctions every week, and one of them was the one here in Brush, Colorado. And the reason I ended up locating here is a fellow that owned the livestock market insisted on me buying the market. Okay, and so you bought that market. Now tell us a little bit of history on, on that particular market. Well, that was Brush Livestock. Brush Livestock was a market that had started back in the, uh, I believe the early 30s, and I'm not real sure on that date, if not before, uh, by uh, Ted Redice and Al Garber. And they both had had a small market in Fort Morgan, and they decided to move uh, the market here to Brush. And then it developed, it started in the uh, railroad yards here in Brush, Colorado. And then they just kind of moved out, uh, left the railroad yards, still used it, but added yards and pens to it. And that's how it finally got started here in Brush. Is this the one that burned down? It is the one that burned down, yes. And what's the backstory on that? Well, uh, the story was that back in, I believe it was 1971, uh, that uh, one night they called me and said, your livestock market's on fire. At that time, I lived in Nine Mile Corner, south of Brush, and you could actually see the outline of the market and everything. And uh, to this day, they really have never decided how. Uh, we did have an outfit come in and do an investigation, but uh, there's still no reason that, that they know why it burned. It was just a big old wooden barn, and uh, we lost about everything we had at that mm-hmm. point. Did you lose cattle? We no, we lost a few hogs. We had a hog barn that was connected, okay. and there were a few hogs that uh, we lost. We were able to get the cattle uh, open gates and get them to move on down the alleys. Okay. And after that, then, <coughs> where did you head in your life? Well, after that, we went ahead and built a new barn, uh, livestock market here in Brush. Uh, it's Brush Livestock that's out uh, east of Brush, and uh, we ran it till 1976, and uh, with the cost of building and our overrunning building, uh, we were pretty well broke. And so we ended up selling the market in 76 and then moved on into other things that we uh, felt were very important as far as the industry was concerned. So you had brush livestock from about 1971 to 1976? Till 1976, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And during that time, what kind of experiences did you have or you know, any notable history <clears throat> moments during that time? Well, uh, you always do in the livestock market from uh, being able to sell uh, reputation cattle just year after year, the same date, uh, getting to know the area and the community. Uh, And in in marketing livestock, you have good years and bad years as far as weather is concerned. And uh, back in that time, we had a couple of years with huge blizzards uh, throughout the winter to where uh, I believe in the mid-60s that... uh, it uh, covered it up with a hundred and some odd inches right here in brush. And uh, wow. so those things are uh, activities and things you really, you know, you really go back and, and look into. We'll talk about Superior, but can you give us a little history on what you know about Livestock Exchange? Well, Livestock Exchange, uh, I believe it was started back in the early 70s or, or in that area. And it was started by a group of people, uh, most of them out of the Greeley, Colorado area. And then it was managed and partially owned by Bob Walker. And that's how the Livestock Exchange started. Uh, We had the two markets. uh, At the time, my market burnt down in 71. Uh, We were both running about the same numbers of cattle. And then Mm -hmm. when the uh, market uh, had to reopen and be shut down for almost a year because of having to rebuild, uh, we did lose a few customers. We lost more customers uh, to Sterling uh, and took a long time to get them back. But at that time, uh, at the market on the hill or uh, Colorado, uh, we, were, we were averaging about three sales a week. We had a lot of special sales. We had huge dairy auctions. And uh, it was a, a very, very good market. Okay. After you sold Brush Livestock Commission Company, 
right? That was the full name of it? Yes, it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. After you sold that, then you entered into your next project with Superior Livestock. Is that right? Well, Is that the I time did, on? but it wasn't Superior Livestock at that point. Uh, after I sold, that was in 1976, uh, I went to work for K Livestock and uh, sold the auction at the Denver Stockyards for oh. many years, which uh, was a great thing. But during that time, I was invited to be on a uh, committee to study electronic marketing, and that was put on by Virginia Tech, uh, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, uh, CSU. Uh, there were six different universities that were uh, part of that uh, study, and I was lucky enough to be part of that. And they studied electronic marketing, and that's when mm -hmm. I uh, thought that by doing it with the video, it'd be the way to go. They came out of the study thinking that uh, at that time it had to be all computer marketing. And I said, that's fine, I'm going to go the other way. And so they, they did the computer marketing. They sold part of their program to a company in, uh, in Canada and the other one to uh, Texas Finance uh, in Fort Worth. Uh, I took the, the uh, video part of it and then started what we had, Odell Cumberland Auctioneers. And uh, we developed the uh, auction at that point, uh, having one the first year, the next year having two auctions a year and uh, we thought we were really doing big things by having from 20,000 to 30,000 cattle. So the video portion of it actually <clears throat> started it with Odo Cumberland. Yes, it was Odo okay. Cumberland for several okay. years. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, then at one point, Chuck Cumberland and myself split up and he kept the farm dispersal part of the business and I took the livestock into the business. Okay, thank you. And working with Chuck Cumberland, any dirt on him? Oh yeah, he was a terrible guy. No, <laughs> not really. Chuck and I were really good partners. Uh -huh. We we enjoyed each other. Chuck was very good professional. Uh, knew what the business was all about. Was a good auctioneer, and uh, we just kind of had our own duties, and and we never stepped on each other's toe. And we were just good partners. Always were. Uh, we did end up going back in partnership a little later on uh, after we had already started Superior and had other things going too. Okay. Okay, then you moved in, started Little <clears throat> Cumberland, then you went into Superior. About what year did you? Uh, we we formed. It was, uh, it was called Odal Li uh, or Odal, excuse me, uh, video at that time when Chuck and I split up. Okay. And then in 1986, Buddy Jeffers from uh, Amarillo, uh, Fort Worth area, came one off. We would merge with his company and start a new company. So. In December of 86, we started the new company, had our first auction in January at the stock show in 1987, and that was called Superior Livestock Auction. Next, okay. And you owned that for how long? Well, I, we owned it until we sold it in uh, 2007, and uh, uh, had about two years off, and the people that bought it uh, were some people out of California, and were big land, land investors, and got in trouble. And so the bank had to take it back. Then I went in and I re ran it then uh, for the bank back in 2009 and was involved up until just about a year ago. Okay. And that would have been in uh, 2016. Jim, what are some of the overall biggest changes that you've seen throughout your years in brush, I guess, with, with regard specifically to the livestock auction barns and the folks that come and go? Well, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting to watch and then go back and look at <clears throat> what was happening when I first started. The, the one thing we see is uh, cattle travel further than they used to. Uh, it's nothing for a set of cattle to be bought here in Brush and hauled back into Iowa, uh, maybe on into Missouri and places like that, where always before the movement of the cattle was more to the feed, which was back here to Brush from the east a lot of the cattle came into brush. And of course from the west, that's where the cattle came to uh, because of the feed and the uh, number of cattle were fed in the 100 mile radius of, of brush. What are some of the challenges that the livestock sale industry in brush has encountered? I know you mentioned the, the fire and I know you mentioned a significant snowstorm, but overall maybe just in general challenges that you've seen in your experience here? Well, uh, there's always challenges when it comes to the livestock market, and that is, uh, I know that 
the, the markets after I was out of had a couple of different instances where uh, people that were buying there uh, went under and left them holding uh, a lot of debt that they had to occur by not getting paid for the cattle. And I know they had some problems that way. Uh, the big challenges are, are still uh, being able to move cattle in and out. Uh, we've been real lucky here in Brush that we haven't had a lot of activists come in and, and uh, do some things that they have done in a lot of the livestock markets around the part of the United States that uh, California and some of those areas are uh, having to fight that every day where we've just had a few of those incidents here in Brush. I was told today just at <coughs> Livestock Exchange that they sell about 50,000 head a year. So why do you, and that's just the one cell barn, why do you think Brush is, just a little side note I guess, why Brush is getting overlooked from some of the animal rights activists? Well, I don't think we have that problem in Colorado as mm, much okay. as they do uh, in the more populated area. If we still had the stockyards in Denver, Colorado, we'd have activists working every day. Uh, the guys at Fort Collins have to be so careful at their livestock market because they do have a few times that they have to watch what's going on because people with cameras and, and things that really don't understand the market. But Brush is not a, a huge center anymore as far as selling cattle live, but any market that sells 50,000 is a very respectable market. Okay. Any other stories or any other nuggets, I guess, if you will, on your experience with sale barns here in Brush and kind of the foundation or history of that? Well, the history of it is, is very exciting when you look back at to the people that started it, which was Ted Redis and, and Al Garber. Al was a, a very good cattleman, but a tremendous bookkeeper. Uh, Ted Redis was a very big promoter and a fellow that would get out and get things done. Uh, used to own 100 or 150,000 acres right around Brush. And so he was quite a developer, but he put it all back into the market to make sure that Brush did have a good market. And I think that history is very important that the, the old timers, what they thought of it and how they did it. I was going to ask you about trends, but I think you've kind of covered that through our conversation. But in your opinion, where do you see the industry headed? Well, I think our industry is <clears throat> going to head just like it always has. Uh, I think we'll see them try to uh, uh, get the different things bigger, different feedlots bigger. Then it's going to back back off and get back into the smaller guy. And it's done that up and down forever and mm -hmm. forever. Uh, you look at the problem that uh, some of the packers have had this last year. Uh, where the parent companies in a different country have had some real, real bad publicity, and it was very well deserved. Uh, you look at Canada and the problem they had because of the mad cow and some of the real outstanding uh, markets they had up in that country that went under because of that. And you go to Europe, and, and the Europe, when they had their mad cow problem, it totally broke the industry there, uh, the people that uh, were handling all of that. But Europe had a tremendous problem in the way they financed their cattle, and. Uh, it just ate the whole industry up when they did have their problem. That's one thing here in the United States, even though we hear a lot of bad things about the packers and stockers and what they do, they do control it well. Sure, we have problems where there's been big losses, but I, I don't see where we're gonna have the problem if we do have a crash that uh, we've seen in some of the other countries. Because especially with the capability of traceability today, I think it's a huge thing. Okay. Talking about the auctioneers now, I know we kind of started down, down that direction just a little bit ago, <clears throat> but if I understand right, the town of Brush is rich in auctioneer history. We've had some champion auctioneers, three world champions, is that right? Yes, we have had three world champions. Can you tell me about them? Yeah, I sure can. Uh, all three of them have worked for me, so I know them all very, very well. Of course, Chuck Cumberland was my partner and became a world champion while we were partners. And uh, he was a great world champion and did a very good job in promoting not only Brush, but, but the auction business. Uh, Ron Ball was the next champion uh, from here in Brush, Colorado. He was working for the, uh, the Brush Life uh, Exchange at the time that happened. Uh, Ron came in here from Iowa and uh, was top to auction back in Iowa, came in with tremendous auctioneer. Then Ralph Wade was the third uh, world champion uh, from the Brush area, also came from Iowa and uh, uh, was a good auctioneer, still is a good auctioneer, he still auctions for uh, superior livestock. Ron Ball still has a small auction company in Tennessee 
and both those gentlemen are still doing good business. And what about yourself? Do you have any accolades as far as your auctioneering? Oh, I've, I've won a few contests in that. It uh, was something I'd like to have done, <clears throat> but something I really didn't ever have time to mm -hmm. look at it and work at it as hard as you need to, to become a world champion. I've won uh, the world region areas two or three different times, but it always seemed like when I really needed to get busy doing it, I was running a business. And to me, the business was more important. Uh, I enjoy good auctioneers. I enjoy hiring good auctioneers. And uh, in, in the different things that I've done, I've had as many as seven uh, world champion auctioneers work for me in different uh, times and different uh, things. So uh, world champions are fine. Uh, I think my best auctioneer was never a world champion, but a really good auctioneer. And what about your, well, the first question is, what drew you into wanting to be an auctioneer? Well, when I was a young man in high school, I went to uh, in the same class with a, a girl by the name of Jeannie Redmond. Her dad was the leading auctioneer in the Greeley area at that time. So uh, the first of my senior year, I asked Jeannie, would ask your dad to see whether there would be an opportunity for a young auctioneer in, in the Greeley area. And she came back the next day and she said, Dad said, there's not a place in the world that an auctioneer could work. There's just too many of them already. So that was kind of put aside. And then... Uh, Later on, I got married and uh, got hailed out two years in a row. And <clears throat> excuse me, I had to start working, and I worked in the back of a livestock market, continued to farm. And uh, they said, "Why don't you get up and sell?" So I did, and I sold some calves and did this, did that. I sold out my beat equipment uh, that would have been back in the uh, oh early '60s. And I told Claude Redmond when I hired him to sell my beat equipment that I'd like to help sell the sale. Well, hoping that he'd let me sell a few items, but instead he made me sell every third item uh, on the auction that day, and then he hired me that year. And so I went to work for him, and then after that, uh, about two years later, I went for the went to work for the large company in Greeley by the name of Austin on Austin, and then it just went on from there. So I've been very lucky, had had a lot mm -hmm. of good breaks. But uh, did you have any formal training or schooling in it, or you saw? Yeah, I did. I, I had real good formal training. I had a John Deere tractor. And it went pop, 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 pop. <laughs> and as I was cultivating corn, I practiced. And that was my form formal training. <laughs> it was on a good John Deere tractor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story. <clears throat> you said you've hired some good auctioneers over the years. So what makes a good auctioneer? Well, that's a great question. I happen to be doing a seminar on that in Denver for the Colorado Auctioneers here in about two weeks. And I have a list of what I really expect out of an auctioneer that is about two type pages full. And it's not the chant, it's not the prettiness that you hear uh, that a singer might do. I like that, I think it's very important, but some of the greatest auctioneers, uh, you look at Celebes and some of those, their auctioneers are just talking people. They don't really have a chant, but they have ethics, they have uh, uh, credibility, uh, they have personality, uh, they have all those things you have to have in any business, not just the auction business, but in any business. It's a great answer. How has the auctioneering occupation changed since you started? Well, of course, the biggest thing that's changed in the auction business has been the computer and uh, all of the uh, auctions that are uh, on the web each and every day. Uh, just this week alone, uh, I bought items on three auctions, one locally, which was Chuck Miller's, and then I bought one on Rollers, which is out of Denver, and on Ritchie Brothers, which are out of Denver. Ritchie Brothers I attended, Rollers I did on the computer. And that is a huge, huge thing uh, that we see all over this part of the country that can be done uh, just without ever having to leave your house. Oh, there, there are, are many stories. I remember one of the uh, stories that I remember as well as anything was the first auction we ever had on the uh, video auction. It was Old Cumberland at that time. And we had one consigner that consigned 6,500 head of cattle. And we were so concerned on how we were going to get that many cattle sold for one person that day. And uh, so we started auctioning, and uh, we had done a lot of uh, calling around, had orders if we needed them. And um, uh, Chuck out of Oklahoma bought the cattle, not Chuck Cumberland, but a, mm -hmm. another gentleman out of, uh, excuse me, out of Omaha, Nebraska. He bought the cattle, and he had an opportunity to take one load or as many as he wanted. And he took the whole 6,500 head of cattle. 
and to us that was never heard of before that you could sell that many at auction with just one bidder. But the neat thing about it was that night we took this seller and his wife out um, to supper and we went to a really nice restaurant there alongside of uh, the airport in Denver and had a nice meal. And Chuck gave the lady the credit card. She came back a little bit and said, uh, your credit card's been denied. And uh, he said, what? And I think he looked at uh, Karen and said, didn't you pay that bill? But anyway, here we just sold 6,500 head of cattle for a guy and our credit card was no good. And so to me, that was a, a tremendous story. Long story short, uh, this gentleman now is in his late 90s and I still do business with him every year, so. That is a good story. Any others? Oh golly, there's so, so many good stories, but uh, you know, we, the, we, the problem stories, we do have problem stories. Uh, we had a huge uh, part of the industry that went broke by the name of Gibson Livestock, and Superior Livestock was very much involved in that because we were selling several million dollars a day to him. And when he went down, uh, we were stuck for several million dollars. We had an opportunity to work with people and, and find out what is going on, how people would hold together and how people would either pay you or not pay you. Uh, some of the people that uh, just wouldn't even pay the bill and wanted to steal the cattle, uh, they mm -hmm. since have not had good luck. The people that come right to you and say, hey, I got the cattle, we'll send you a check for them. Those people have done nothing but bigger and better and move on. So I think the uh, philosophy in life is, is if you do things right, it'll always come back and, and be right for you in the long run. And you may have just answered this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What is the biggest challenge in being an auctioneer? Well, I think the biggest challenge in being an auctioneer is to make sure that you're working for the person that's paying you that day uh, and, and doing it in a credible way. Uh, you've got to be able to uh, read your people, make sure that the people you're uh, doing business with are uh, bidding uh, in a proper manner that they're not trying to buy say 20 different classes of cattle then you know that something's wrong. So you've got to be able to read your people, uh, read the product you're selling whether it's cattle or whatever it might happen to be. You've got to know what that product's worth and all, all it takes is just a little bit of studying prior to the auction. We did have a, a tremendous farm auction company, it was called Odell Cumberland Auctioneers and uh, we were at that time there's a lot of small farm auctions so uh, that were selling out, and when I say small, they were from 20,000 to 80,000, where today one tractor will bring more than that. <clears throat> but we sold, uh, in 1981, I believe it was, we had 326 auctions that year, uh, farm auctions and real estate auctions in 26 different states, including Alaska. And so at that time, Odell Cumberland was the big name in the auction business throughout the United States. and. Uh, we had great crews, our, our crews worked so hard, you know, we had to balance one to two sales every day and get that money paid out within just a few days. And uh, it, it was just a lot of fun. We had a, a really good group of people and we all worked together and, and spent time together and enjoyed every bit of it. I assume that was at the very beginning of the, or maybe it was during the farm crisis, what we refer to as the farm yes, crisis. Yes, when we were 80, 81 was the farm crisis after the high interest of 18 to 21 percent and uh, so many of the small people just uh, ended up going broke. The, the started off just ahead of the farm crisis that everybody was buying new equipment to save on their taxes and then they couldn't pay for the equipment because the interest went up so high and it was a catch-21 and it just broke so many people. Mm -hmm. And that was really at the time that uh, I was ready to kind of make a change uh, because uh, I took a lot of that personal because I'd went broke in 76 and, uh, and so I did a lot of counseling, a lot of hours with people that uh, were really in trouble and so at that time when Chuck and I decided to, he's going to take the farm equipment and I took over the livestock part. Gotcha. Okay. Odell Cumberland, uh, we had done the uh, oil and gas leases for the state of Colorado and the BLM, uh, colleague, we must have done them for 25 years I suppose. And uh, it, it was always a fun way. It was it, the, the auction chant on those was very much different because you were dealing with uh, oil and gas people that were more or less desk people and people that you took your time with and, and did it in, in a slower manner. manner. But uh, we sold the last uh, oil and gas for the BLM. It happened to be in Wyoming just last spring, which at that sale, and I can't tell you exactly, but we sold 
around $164 million worth of oil and gas leases in that one day. Wow. And how come you're not continuing to do any of that? Well, it goes back to what we talked about earlier in the auction business. The Oil and Gas uh, Commission has decided it'll all be done over the computer mm. with no live auctioneer. Wow. That's a big change. Okay. All right. Are you still auctioneering now, Jim? Oh, only when something special comes special up. I, I, I spend most of my time at two feed yards and a ranch. Since we're talking a little bit in history and a little bit in current, you know, I know Chuck Miller and some Bryce and Miller continue to operate a fairly large auction facility here east of Brush. Not necessarily livestock, but a lot of farm equipment, implements, and miscellaneous, he calls it. <laughs> a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But there's some history that you have with Chuck Miller as well and getting him started. Yeah, very much so. Uh, Chuck, my oldest son, Ted, went to auction school uh, when Chuck uh, Cumberland was still teaching in Kansas City. They both graduated the same year. Uh, both of them went to work for Odell Cumberland Auctioneers. And uh, I think Chuck worked for us for about two or three years and wanted to go out on his own. And he came and talked to me. And I said, Chuck, do it. I mean, you're young. You can, you can do it. It's going to be tough, but go ahead and do it. And since then, he's, he's done real well. Going back, my son Ted graduated at the same time. Uh, he owns a livestock market in Butte, Montana. Uh, handles a lot of other sales up there. So both those boys came out, did a really good job, and both of them have been very, very successful. Chuck does a tremendous job uh, with his uh, auction. Uh, he's a little stubborn. He's a, a, a Dutchman, as we well know, and he's very proud of it. But he does enjoy uh, the live auction part of it. And uh, Bryson, his son, has really promoted the, the video side of it along with the live auction. And what they're doing is turning out really, really well. And uh, I'm, I'm so proud of both of them. They do a good job. Do you continue to do any consulting, any work like that, helping? I, I do. I, uh, mm -hmm. I do with a lot of the auctioneers. Uh, oh. And that's probably one of the things that I see the, a big problem with a lot of auction companies is the people that are running the auction company don't take time to really have somebody that is a coordinator. Uh, I don't care whether it's a radio show or whether it's a TV show or whether it's a, a roping. You've got to coordinate the whole the whole operation, and that is not done in public ahead of, as as it's going on. That's done ahead of time, and then it's with con consulting after an auction, so it'll be different the next time. And I see too many times uh, auction companies try to correct things uh, and maybe suggest a little too strong that you've done something wrong during the auction. And uh, each auction company should have somebody coordinating it, whether it's the head auctioneer, or whether it's a, a bookkeeper, whoever it might happen to be, that's picking out the things that need to change. And while you were talking, you brought up another point that we talked a little bit about <clears throat> last time and I kind of forgot about it, but that you have a big um, project that you do with your Cowboy Church television show. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it's something that's been uh, re really, really uh, great. It's something that I enjoy so much. We we put on a cowboy church uh, uh, church service every Sunday. Uh, it airs on the RFD and on the Cowboy Channel. Uh, on every Sunday, we're on four times uh, the same program, but run four times a day. And then we do a lot of uh, different events. Uh, we do the, a big one at the Stock Show, a big one at the American. Uh, we travel around to different cowboy churches film them and then edit them down and show them to the public. And the main reason for that is just to reach people that maybe don't have the opportunity to go to church. We get a lot of comments back from people that are maybe hospital, uh, can't get out. Uh, and uh, it's just been such a, a great benefit to me uh, being able to provide that uh, each and every week. And we've done it for many years and it looks like it'll go on for quite some time. We have two great hosts, uh, Susie McIntyre, uh, does a really good job, and Russ Weaver out of Texas is our other host, and they both do really good jobs. And you've been doing that since what year? Oh, I think I started that would have been back in 2009, I think okay. it was when we started it. Um, my producer and our uh, production bus is based out of uh, Branson, Missouri, and that way we're kind of centrally located to, to go to many different places. Neat.